Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here to talk about the nature of consciousness. Uh, uh, the first encounter, serious encounter with consciousness for me was uh, when I was running uh, Synaptics, uh, one of my companies, uh, and uh, we were doing artificial neural networks at that time. And uh, I asked myself, can we make a conscious computer? Uh, so in other words, can a machine be conscious. As you probably remember, some of you, in the late 50s, computer scientists believed that they could build intelligent computers within 20, 30 years. They would be, in many respects, smarter than we are. In, that, in those days, intelligence was generally equated with consciousness. The brain was generally thought of as a computer. And consciousness was believed to be similar to the software that runs in the brain computer. Well, today computers are not one bit more conscious than the computers of the late 50s, despite being hundreds of billions of times more complex and powerful than them. Though today we have a better understanding of what consciousness is, yet its nature is still largely shrouded in mystery. So imagine a self-driving car, something that will probably be commonplace in 15, 20 years, a object with a sophisticated vision and guidance system, the ability to communicate with road services, GPS, neighboring cars, and so on, a wired in purpose, it is inherent in the software that runs this machine, and a clear goal, which is the destination which has been programmed by the presumably by the, by the human being, uh, is this car conscious? Certainly, we have to be conscious in order to drive a car. Well, does it perceive the outer world? Oh, well, yes, it depends how you, what you define perception to be. But does it have sensations and feelings? No. Does it understand what it's doing? No. Does it have free will? In other words, can it decide at one point to turn right instead of turning left? No. Can it make intelligent decisions and actions? Well, it depends how you call intelligence, so the answer here is maybe yes and no. It depends on the program, how intelligent is the program, how adaptive is the program. Does it have a sense of self and an inner world? Absolutely not. Does it have flexibility, creativity, imagination, intuition, the qualities that define the higher points of our own consciousness? Definitely no. So what is consciousness? Obviously, there is not a well-accepted definition, so I give you mine. To me, consciousness is the capacity to experience and to direct one's experience, and also the fabric of which experience is made. It's what gives form, meaning, and purpose to our existence and to our experience. Consciousness can also be seen as the capacity to illuminate and integrate the information coming from the physical world to highlight its significance to the self. The contents of consciousness are sensations and feelings, what philosophers call qualia. Quale is the specific sensation produced by something, for example, the smell of a rose, the taste of wine, the redness of an object, the image of a thought that crosses our mind. The information coming from the physical world is converted into sensations and feelings within consciousness. In some sense, qualia display information in a relevant, integrated, and immediate way so that it is more, uh, my, my goodness, I didn't realize that we don't have the full screen. That's what happens when you are com incompatible uh, with, uh, you know, but PC are not compatible with apples. I mean, they haven't figured out that yet, you know. How can you figure out consciousness? <laughs> Sorry about it. Um, so, anyway, so quality display information in, in, a, in a way which is uh, 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 immediate, so it is more relevant to the, to the self. So the very objects that we perceive out there 
are actually shaped, texture, color, placed in relationship with other objects and named in our mental space, in our consciousness. Out there, there is only a dynamic quantum field containing the superposition of the fields of all elementary particles, all the forces, and of space-time. So my body is an integral, inseparable part of that quantum field, and the interaction of my body with the rest of the quantum field produces the physical information the consciousness translates into qualia. Qualia, in some sense, camouflage physical reality, giving me the illusion of a stable and predictable world, and of me and not me. Ultimately, consciousness results from the interplay of five fundamental, irreducible, and interdependent aspects, like five facets of a, wall, of a whole, perception, comprehension, identity, free will, and action. So let's take a look. Perception, I define as the capacity to have a sentient experience based on qualia. So this perception is not the perception of a machine. Machine doesn't have qualia. Bits in memory, electromagnetic energy, or electrical signals in the brain, in the brain or in a machine do not produce qualia. Information carried by electromagnetic energy is converted into qualia via so far mysterious process. There is no known physical principle that can account for such conversion. We do not know how this conversion occurs. But certainly there is information in the physical world, but we perceive that information within ourselves, within our own consciousness, as qualia, as sensations and feelings. The laws of physics do not explain how qualia may arise based on the information that is present in the quantum field. The next aspect, irreducible aspect, is comprehension. It's the capacity to organize, integrate, and understand the information contained in a given experience and to give it its widest possible meaning within the context of the totality of our own experience. So comprehension is the aha we perceive when we discover the hidden pattern in the data that allows us to understand in a flash of insight. In other words, it, just before the aha, we had exactly the same information that we had after, except now the dots, the qualia, have been connected. Now you understand. And that's, you, that's much, much beyond qualia. And that's something that most people don't pay much attention to as a phenomenal kind of uh, uh, property that we have. So qualia are the dots that are connected into an integrated whole by comprehension. And the more dots are connected, the higher the comprehension. So comprehension is an inherent, irreducible, holistic property of consciousness, even more important than qualia. Identity is the capacity to be identified as itself within itself, is to have a sense of self, is the ability to discriminate between self and non-self. Identity is unique, and it gives us the sense of agency, a unique point of view, and provides the fundamental context within which perception, comprehension, action, and free will operate and have significance. Intention, purpose, meaning, and free will make no sense without identity. Identity is the referent of experience. It is the I to which the experience belongs. And free will is the capacity to choose in accordance to one's own will and intentions. It's the ability to decide a specific course of action based on the available comprehension and consistent with the intentions and purposes of the self. And free will is inextricably connected with the sense of self as an autonomous, independent, and unique self. Finally, action is the ability of the self to directly affect the outer environment via a physical body. Action requires consciousness to communicate with a body that can receive information from the physical environment and affect the environment in turn. 
So consciousness transforms physical information into qualia, makes a decision, which is based on comprehension, down within consciousness, and then transforms the qualia decision back into information to affect the environment via the body. So the process is as shown below. The environment sends information to the body. The body processes the information through the sensory brain system. That information then with, you know, goes to the consciousness that, in a sense, inhabits the body, produces qualia, produces a decision. The decision then informs the body, and the body affects the environment. So physics cannot explain consciousness. As I said earlier, based on physics, there is no explanation why we should be conscious at all. There is no known physical principle that explains how electrical activity in the brain can produce qualia. And current physical theories can only explain a world with outer aspects and no inner aspect. The fact that we have both aspects is neither predicted nor predictable by physics, according to which interiority cannot be ontological. It is an epiphenomenon. Yet, the most direct observation I can make is that I am, I exist. No machine can do that because machines have no interiority. Neuroscientists generally believe that the proof that consciousness is an epiphenomenon of the brain is that it exists only as long as the brain is functional. However, this is a circular proof based on the presupposition that only matter exists. And therefore, if only matter exists, consciousness must be in the brain and it has to be produced there. But if consciousness exists in a different domain of existence, then the brain could simply be a terminal, something that translates from one domain, which is the physical domain, to the domain of consciousness. So what if consciousness is a property emerging not from the interaction of atoms and molecules within the brain, but from some primordial awareness already present in the energy of which everything is made? If the energy of the Big Bang, the energy that creates space, time, and matter, contains also the seed of consciousness, then consciousness is a primary, irreducible, self-reflecting property of such energy, just like space-time and, and the quantum field are. This assumption is reasonable since the nature of the observer is fundamental to both general relativity and quantum physics, and the observer is intimately connected with consciousness in still mysterious ways. In other words, the nature of the observer and the nature of what constitutes observation are central. And I believe that general relativity and quantum physics have only touched lightly upon the rea what, means, what it means to observe, what it means to have an observation. This hypothesis then provides a new path to the unification of physics, the unification of inner and outer realities, and the unification of science and spirituality. So if the seed of consciousness is introduced as a basic property of the energy of the Big Bang, the energy that existed before the Big Bang, so it didn't exist in the physical world, this energy is the creative energy, dynamic and, and self-aware of which everything is made, then nature has a cognitive and sentient principle ab initio. In other words, this, the, the cognitive principle doesn't have to come out afterwards uh, you know, through the process of evolution of life. It is already present in the beginning. Reality also, from the beginning, has both an inner and an outer aspect from the beginning. We can then postulate that the purpose of the universe is for energy to know itself via its consciousness, which is a property which is, uh, uh, cannot be taken apart from this energy. This energy has three facets and they cannot be taken apart. There is a totality, they are co-emergent. Notice that the emergence of consciousness from the Big Bang is no more obscure than the emergence of space, time and matter from the same energy. The duality of mind and matter is thus resolved. So what does it mean uh, if we look at reality uh, in this fashion? Well, in this view then, 
our own physical world is one of many manifestations of energy. And I use capital E for this type of energy. It's not the physical energy that we normally uh, deal with in physics. Everything is made of conscious and dynamic energy. And everything is connected from the inside. The urge of consciousness to know itself, which is this cognitive principle, which is at the basis of, of consciousness, propels then the evolution of both matter and consciousness. And this movement becomes a co-evolution where both aspects help each other grow and evolve. The ever-increasing organizational complexity of matter functions like a mirror reflecting to consciousness its ever-increasing self-knowing in the sense that the physical structure is isomorphic with the cognitive structure within consciousness. Thus, the nature of physical reality cannot be fully disclosed by examining only its outer aspects because consciousness and matter co-evolve. One affects the other and therefore the outer aspect is influenced by the inner aspect and vice versa. So energy creates consciousness units, each endowed with a unique identity, free will, and the same urge to know themselves. And their interaction creates all universes. So matter is like the ink with which consciousness writes its own self-knowing, allowing it to more clearly perceive the cognitive structures within itself. The interaction between consciousness and matter may account for the observed evolution of the physical universe from space-time to elementary particles to inanimate forms and to ever more complex living forms. The increasing complexity of the material forms reflects the increasing self-knowing of consciousness. Coevolution may also explain how the laws of physics could evolve from simple to complex over time in step with the evolution of consciousness. It removes the need to have the laws of physics appear in their final form all at once, in fact, just before the Big Bang, which is an unreasonable hypothesis in a dynamic universe in constant evolution. It, was, it probably made sense when people thought that the universe was static at the time of uh, Einstein, but in, a, in the universe that exists today, why should the laws of physics appear all made at the beginning of the universe? It may remove the need for the fundamental constants of physics to have ab initio the unbelievably fine adjustments found in our universe, which is a recognized problem in physics. It may also explain how space-time and matter energy like container and content simultaneously arise out of the interactions of the consciousness units. Coevolution functions like a reentrant feedback, which is the hallmark of living systems and intelligence. It's like a bootstrapping process that allows consciousness to know itself by a mirroring process with matter, and in turn affects matter by reflecting its increased self-knowing into increased organizational complexity of matter. Living matter, of course, is at the top of the complexity scale, thus documenting the high level of self-knowing achieved by consciousness. We have 10 to the 29 elementary particles on average in our body, which is a huge number. <laughs> and they all work together, and in fact, they all flow through our body, and they maintain the integrity of the body. This unbelievable, unbelievable capacity of life which is possible within this uh, this world. If the purpose of the physical universe is to facilitate the process of consciousness to know itself, it follows that the natural evolution we observe cannot be driven only by random variation and selection. Since the time needed to evolve forms based on random variations grows exponentially with the complexity of the form, to evolve forms with infinitesimal probability of success we must have some reasonable percentage of variations with far higher probability of success than random ones. These variations can actually be produced based on choices informed by the ever-increasing self-knowing of consciousness and via epigenetics. These variations, however, are not guaranteed success. 
they still need to be selected for fitness via a successful interaction, interactions with the, within the ecosystem. Thus, the physical universe functions like a giant virtual reality game in which physical avatars controlled by their respective consciousness interact in the virtual world in accordance with evolving laws valid for all forms for the purpose of increasing the self-knowing of all the selves participating in the game. Where do we go from here? Wishing to do science and not start a new religion, we need to further develop the conceptual structure that emerges if we assume consciousness to be the primary aspect of nature. We need to then develop a mathematical theory that makes testable predictions and contains the current physics as a limit case. We also need to make new predictions with a new mathematics that not only falsify the hypothesis that consciousness is an epiphenomenon, but more importantly, predict new phenomena that fundamentally change our world and our worldview for the better. I realize that this is a tall order, but if the time is right for this to happen, and I believe it is, then it will happen. This is also the program of the Federico Navia Fagin Foundation to which I'm dedicating the rest of my life. Thank you very much. Do, do we have time for some questions? Yeah. Does your model permit the existence of disembodied consciousness, you know, like spirits or ghosts or... Um, you know, where we go after death, for example. Well, my model essentially uh, talks about a consciousness uh, which is made of selves and selves of selves and selves of selves of selves in a hierarchy of selves existing in a domain of existence which is not space-time and that communicates with the physical world. But the physical world in reality is really emerging within this consciousness. So the physical world is, is fundamentally created by consciousness to be the instrument through which consciousness knows itself. Okay, so that's the idea. Obviously, a self, once created, is created forever. Matter can disappear, can disgregate, but the self that inhabits that body will not perish. Yeah. Over there. Okay, hi, thank you very much, that's great. Um, so what we're looking at, if we're creating a new mathematical model, we're looking at essentially um, interacting infinities or the level of like how these different mathematical forms that we have so far, if we evolve our mathematics, then we go back to the in inherent integrity that underlies the whole system and we're looking at how we can evolve consciousness or a higher order of consciousness with higher orders of integrated infinities yeah. as the system evolves? All right, my, my thinking here is that we cannot uh, have a mathematical model of consciousness itself. Consciousness is, is about infinities. And so it would, it would require all the possible sets of all sets to, to, to define, you know, all the possible mathematics would, would be necessary to describe consciousness. So I'm talking of the mathematics of the interaction between consciousness and, and the physical world. And so it is a new way to look at the, at the laws of the physical world with the presence of consciousness that actually is affecting the physical world. So is a, is a, is, is a, you know, it's not the, a complete mathematical theory of consciousness. Consciousness and qualia are beyond mathematics, in my opinion. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I can't help but think that the conscious unit of you, yeah. the conscious unit, the CU, yeah. seems awfully like a soul. Say, say it again. Seems like a soul. The soul. 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 S-O-U-L. A oh, oh, soul. Yeah. Uh, well, they, 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 are, they are like the, the atoms, the, the atoms of identity out of which every identity of identities is created. 
Yeah. So, uh, but they are infinite themselves. They are all in superposition. They exist in this domain of existence. Mm. They are all in superposition. And the totality of them is oneness, mm. is a undivided wholeness. Okay. Yeah. Did it look? Yeah. Question? Yeah, uh, it's kind of a two part question. I mean, as you described the co evolution of matter and consciousness, yeah. I, it occurs to me two things. One is how are those two realms connected? How do they. Uh, you know, influence each other. And the second is, uh, do you really believe in the idea that they're isomorphic? I mean, isomorphic uh, implies one-to-one. -one. Yeah. The, um, the isomorphism is only between the structure of physical matter and the, and the cognitive structure of a comprehension that is made, which is a, you know, one of many comprehensions that consciousness has. So it just, it just re refers to one, uh, one comprehension. Okay. Uh, the uh, I forgot the other. The first the, question. The other, yeah. So, so they're each evolving uh, in parallel, at least. But what's the? Is there a back and forth? Uh, in oh yeah, yeah. The, the communication. Yeah. The, the mechanism by which by which uh, uh, you know quantum phenomena communicate with consciousness and vice versa, they, they they will be defined by the mathematics. They will they will have to to develop. So, in other words, the the detail how, the, how that works, I have no idea at this point. I'm trying to create a conceptual structure that if it sort of hangs together, it will inspire the type of mathematics which is needed to actually uh, go one step further. Thank this you. is just a starting point. Thank you. It's not an ending point. In fact, it's just the beginning of a starting point. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, I had a question. Uh, in response to a previous question, you indicated that like once uh, the consciousness unit was created that it kind of stays there whether the body decays or something like that. But if I understand you correctly, there's this uh, constant feedback loop where... Uh, constant what? A constant feedback loop yeah. mm -hmm. where uh, new conscious structures are kind of tested you might say for uh, fitness in a physical reality and presumably those that are not fit kind of deteriorate or they lose uh, activation energy or, or something, maybe they even disappear. So I was wondering on what basis do you think that consciousness always, uh, once created in a particular form, always stays that way? It seems like our, exist, our, our experience is that uh, things are constantly changing. That includes uh, things falling apart as well as becoming more complicated. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that would have to be uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, fundamental assumptions that had to be taken as an assumption. In other words, the assumption that identities once created are not destroyed, for example, that would have to be uh, you know, part of the, part of the uh, axioms that you have to use in a theory. In other words, you, you know, that, like the, you know, the, the axioms that the, 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 the purpose of uh, consciousness is to know itself. I mean, you, you know, some, somebody may argue. So the value of those axioms are only if, if in a mathematical theory you make testable predictions which are verifiable. That, that's it. I mean, you know, I mean, if you look at the axioms of quantum physics, they look, they look crazy, you know. But well, you know, they work. So, so then that validates the having chosen those axioms. So, yeah. Thank you. Please right. stay for Thanks. the panel to hear more from Frederico. Frederico? Yeah. Thank you very much.